can have a seat. Awesome job. What a great worship set this morning. Great testimony. Oh, hope you're glad you came to church. Those of you um, watching online, if you, if you can be here, you should try to be here. It's, it's not quite the same when you watch it online <clears throat> as being here with everybody singing. So if you're able to make it, we'd love to have you. Uh, my name's Matt. I'm part of the teaching team here. Um, I'm excited because today we're starting what we are calling the Summer of Prayer. All summer, we're going to be teaching and practicing prayer. We're actually going to be having uh, some prayer exercises throughout the summer to help make the teaching practical. Although we're going to be learning a lot about prayer through the summer, I want to encourage you if you're not already, to start thinking and practicing prayer now. If you're not in the habit of praying, I would encourage you to start. And if you do pray, I would encourage you to consider doing it more. If you're not sure how to pray, that's okay, because we're starting the summer of prayer by talking about the model prayer, which is the Lord's Prayer, as you probably have heard it. Most of you are probably familiar with it. It's found in Matthew's and Luke's Gospels. So for the whole month of June and then into July, we'll be teaching through the Lord's Prayer verse by verse using Matthew's account in chapter 6. So let's start by looking at this prayer as a whole. It's found in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. It'll be up on the screen, but if you want to follow along in your physical Bible or your Bible app or whatever, um, that would be cool too. This is from the New King James Version. All the verses that we'll be using today are from there. It says, in this manner, therefore, pray. This is Jesus talking. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's the Lord's Prayer as we, we know it. Today we're going to look at that first verse, which is verse 9, and says, In this manner therefore pray, our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. For the next little bit, I want to take that verse and work through it, unpack it, talk about what the different parts of that mean. So it starts out by saying, in this manner. If you want to take notes, there's some in your bulletin or some on the Daily Church app. Or you can just write them down a piece of paper. You can just memorize everything, and that way you can remember it later and put it into practice. In this manner is the first thing it says, which means in this way. This is the way we're supposed to pray. Jesus is saying, pray like this. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to copy this prayer in order for it to be a good prayer. And there also isn't anything wrong with reciting the Lord's Prayer. Sometimes that can help us to do that. And it's called the Lord's Prayer, but it's really more a prayer for his disciples. It's an outline. It's a model for how to pray. And it's really for us. It's not really for the Lord. He knew how to pray. Jesus is our example in everything. And he is a master teacher. So it's just like Jesus to teach us how to pray by giving us the example of prayer and demonstrating it. That's just like Jesus. So it says, in this manner, pray. And then it says, our Father. I want to look at those two words next. Our Father. The word our would indicate that prayer, at least sometimes, should be done in community. Should be done together. Prayer is not meant to only be an individual exercise. He doesn't say my father, which would have been accurate. He says our father. And this, this uh, community is found in other parts of the prayer. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Lead us 
not into temptation, deliver us from evil. It's an instant reminder that we are part of a community. See, prayer reminds us that we are not alone. Henry Nouwen said this about prayer. Much that has been said about prayer might create the false impression that prayer is a private, individualistic, and nearly secret affair, so personal and so deeply hidden in our inner life that it can hardly be talked about, even less be shared. The opposite is true. Just because prayer is so personal and arises from the center of our life, it is to be shared with others. And just because prayer is the most precious expression of being human, it needs the constant support and protection of the community to grow and flower. Just because prayer is our highest vocation, needing careful attention and faithful perseverance, we cannot allow it to be a private affair. Just because prayer asks for a patient waiting and expectation, it should never become the most individualistic expression of the most individualistic emotion, but should always remain embedded in the life of the community of which we are a part. Our shows us that we're part of that community. And it's comforting and encouraging to know that whenever you pray, there is somebody else somewhere who's also praying to the same Father. That's comforting to know. He says, our Father. Our Father. So our tells us we are part of a community. Father tells us that that community is a family. He doesn't say our friend, which would have been accurate. He doesn't say our leader, which also would have been accurate. He says our Father. Because this is about family. And all the ours who are praying are part of this family. We are praying as children of God. We are praying to God as his children. Many of us remember being kids and someone saying to us, go ask your father. And for many people, that phrase, go ask your father, was sure to cause panic and fear. Sometimes asking your father, or for some of you, it might have been your mother, could be very scary. For me, I was always nervous to ask my dad about money. Now, my dad is here, so I'm going to try to be as nice as possible. <clears throat> but I was always afraid to ask him for money. My dad, when we were growing up, was very <sighs> frugal. Yeah. We'll go with that. That was the word he always used, so we'll go with that. In fact, my dad was so frugal that he taught us that the ice cream man was actually the music man. <laughs> and he would drive through the neighborhood and play music because kids just love to listen to fun music. And we would say, well, dad, but why is there pictures of ice cream and popsicles on? Oh, well, kids love to look at those things while the music's playing. So out of the goodness of their heart, these people would just drive around neighborhoods. And the kids would just sit around and look at the pictures. Sometimes they would even flag the music man down so they get up and get a closer look at those pictures or listen to the music a little bit more closely. And then one day, my uncle came over. <clears throat> and the music man was driving by. And see, my dad gave away with this because we grew up in a neighborhood where they were there really weren't any other kids, so we didn't really ever see what it actually was. And my uncle said, you know what? Let me go buy you guys, let me go buy you kids an ice cream from the ice cream man. We were like, I don't know about the place you live in. It sounds like it must be a real rich neighborhood. But in our neighborhood, <laughs> it's just the music man. The guy just drives around playing music. And he was like, follow me. <laughs> And we discovered that it was indeed the ice cream man. Now, being a dad, and having had little kids, I understand why he said that. Um, because, you know, two or three popsicles or ice cream from the ice cream man, you could go buy several boxes of ice cream for that same amount of money. So I understood now why he told us that. Often we hear about God as our father as it relates to prayer, and we 
subconsciously attribute everything about our own fathers to God. So if we were afraid or nervous or worried about asking our fathers for something, when we hear that God is our father and we can pray to him, we often bring that fear, that anxiety, that nervousness, that worry into praying to God. Because of this, many people approach prayer, if they pray at all, from a position of fear. They pray, but they're afraid God won't listen, or they're afraid that God will get mad. They're afraid that God won't answer their prayer. This keeps so many people from knowing and praying to our Father. Here's the good news. We can pray boldly. We can pray boldly. Two of my favorite verses in the Bible are Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Let me pause there. This is talking about Jesus as our high priest. Let me give you some, a quick background. We're going to come back to this at the end of the message. But in the Old Testament, there was a high priest who was allowed to go into what was called the Holy of Holies. And he would go into this special room once a year, and that's where the presence of God was. So this one person, this high priest, got to go in and talk to God and be in the presence of God. Now, Jesus is the ultimate high priest. We're going to talk about what happened and why that is in a few minutes. But Jesus is the ultimate high priest. So when Hebrews is talking about high priest, talking about Jesus, are you with me? Okay. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, now if you've heard me speak long enough, you probably know what's coming. When you see the word therefore, you find out what? It's therefore, therefore, right. So because we have this high priest, Jesus, who was tempted in all points like we are yet without sin, because of that, we can come, what does it say? Okay, now let's try saying it based on what the definition of it is. So it, it, what it means is to you know, be bold, so let's try to say it boldly, okay? Let us therefore come what? Boldly. Much better boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, there's no need to fear prayer. We can pray with confidence that we're not going to be judged or scolded or mocked. It says in that first, in verse 15, it says, he was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. We can come boldly because he understands. He knows temptation. He knows sorrow. He knows suffering. He knows pain. He knows death. He gets it. You can bring him your pain. You can pray to him about your suffering. You can pray to him about the grief that you have, about the temptations that you're facing, about the things that you're going through, because Jesus knows what it's like to be human because he was one. So he gets it. There's no need to be afraid. We can approach boldly because he knows what we're going through. Isn't it awesome? To have someone we can pray to who understands what we're going through. Pray with confidence that he understands. He cares. Prayer is how we access the throne of grace. Verse 16 said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Prayer is how we access the throne of grace. It's not a throne of judgment or condemnation or guilt or shame or disappointment. See, the throne itself isn't filled with grace. It's not a grace-filled throne. It's a throne of grace because the one who occupies it is gracious. It's a throne of grace because the one who sits on the throne is filled with grace. This is so cool. If you really start getting into studying the Bible, it's just, it's just cool. It is really cool. I mean, it's inspired by God, divine, so that makes sense. But in this use of the word grace, when it says throne of grace, this has the idea of someone leaning into something. 
Man, I love that. It's Jesus on the throne of grace, leaning in because he wants to listen. Because he wants to bless you. See, that is the opposite of what some of us would expect when we come to God's throne through prayer. In the Old Testament times, if you approached the king's throne and he didn't want to speak to you, he could have thrown you in prison or even have you executed just because you wanted to talk to him and he didn't want to talk to you. That's a reason to be afraid to come to the throne. But that's why this verse is so powerful. He's saying it's a king, but he's on a throne of grace. He's leaning in. He's, he's listening. That's why the verse is so powerful. Now, this isn't in your notes, but you might want to write it down or tweet it or something, because this is really good. Your picture of God on the throne will have an impact on your prayers. I'm going to say it again. Your picture of God on the throne will have an impact on your prayers. How do you picture God? As a grumpy old man? That's going to affect the way you pray to him. Because you're going to say, um, God, how you doing this morning? It's a little cloudy outside, so I'm wondering if maybe you're a little grumpy. <laughs> do you picture God as too busy for you? God, I hate to bother you, but... Do you picture God on the throne angry that you interrupted him? Because he's keeping the world spinning and you would dare to come and ask about something silly? Like, God, please help me find my car keys so I'm not late for work. Do you picture God as disappointed in you? Maybe annoyed that you're here again about that same thing? that we just talked about and you see, you see God you're praying again and you, and you just you hear God and it sounds like God is saying you know what we've been over this I've told you to leave him and just dump him and be done with it but you just you're, you're not listening and I'm just getting sick of this just do what I told you to do follow my words look in scripture do we picture God as having bigger things to worry about? We hear people say that. Well, he has bigger things to worry about than my problems. No, see, that's how we are with our children. That's how we are in our relationships. We get that way. I have permission to share this. I just want to say that. Um, but Angie, my wife, she is nervous to ask me to help her with anything that's technological. Because, and this is, I, I totally admit, it's a character flaw. This is, I, don't, I don't get this, but this is, I know, I'm working on it, okay? Not perfect. I get really frustrated if people can't figure out technological stuff. I mean, it just, it gets, I, I have no patience. I get really frustrated. I know some of you are like, well, I'm never going to ask him to help me with my phone, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> if you want to download the Daily Church app, ask somebody else. <laughs> but she gets nervous. And just the other day, she was trying to order a new phone online and asked if I could help her with it. And I said, <laughs> said just, <laughs> she'll tell you this is true. I said, just, just give me a few minutes, gather myself together, and then, then I can help. <laughs> it's not her problem, it's mine. But this is, so, so when she needs help with something technological, it's kind of like, um, babe, can you help me? And we, those are the things we do in our relationships, and we think that that's how God is. That's our view sometimes of God, but I hope that we can get a picture of God on the throne of grace. And he is so happy to hear from you. He's just got a big smile on his face. He's, he's excited that his child wants to spend time with him. He's leaning toward us because he just wants to hear what it is we have to say. 
that we would picture God on the throne. As soon as we bow our head, he's going to tell me all about it. And here's the thing. He already knows. And he still wants to hear it. How many of us can say that in our relationships? If you already know something and the person's going to tell you something that you already know, none of us want to hear it. God does. I wish that we could picture him just leaning in because he can't wait to bless us. He's just so eager to help. He, he's this gracious God. He's just waiting to talk to you. And too many times we're afraid and worried that we just don't even pray, not knowing that he's actually leaning down, just waiting, hoping to hear from us because he loves to hear from his children. He is our father. Scott, if you can put the verse back up there, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. I just want to prove this is what it says. We may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we approach the throne of grace, we can find grace and mercy to help us when we need it. Mercy is when you don't get the bad things that you deserve. And grace is when you do get the good things you don't deserve. Do you follow that? Okay, because I don't know if I said it right. So hopefully, <laughs> mercy is when you don't get the bad things you deserve. Grace is when you don't get, or when you do get the good things you don't deserve. Both of those we find when we come in prayer. And then it says this, and this is another thing that's so cool. It says, to help in time of need. Now that word to help, it's actually a nautical term that they used during when the, when the Bible was written. They used this term. And what it means is it's actually referring to the ropes that they would use when they would pull into port and they would throw the ropes out and they'd tie the ropes around the dock to keep the boat secure. They, they, those were called the helps. I mean, it's not what it was called then, but that's how it would translate into English is the help. Right? It helps to secure the boat. It's what you have to have to keep you from sinking. You see where we're going with this? He says, come boldly to the throne so that you can find the help that you need to secure your sinking vessel just in time. If you're worried about drifting away or you're worried because there's storms all around you and you're taking on water and you don't think you can make it, you can pray for the help. And Jesus is the help that will secure you in the times when it seems like you won't make it. So if you're sinking, sometimes you just pray help. And sometimes that's the prayer. Sometimes the prayer is one word, it's help. Because that's all you can get out. That's what our hope is. It's found in him. We used to sing this hymn when I was a kid. And it said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's what we put it in. And that's one of the reasons that we pray when we need help. Prayer is our call for help. Sometimes all we can squeeze out is help. But he wants to help. Rich's testimony proved that. He wants to help. So don't be afraid. Go ask your father. Go ask him. Because he wants to hear from you. In this manner pray, our father, and then the next phrase is in heaven. Now, we kind of read that in modern times, and it's like, yeah, we know. Okay, Jesus, thanks. Our father in heaven. But it's, so it seems, can it seem a little strange to us, but it gives us clarity and it gives us perspective. See, at that time, there was a lot of little G gods that they followed and worshiped. So Jesus is making it really clear that when he says our father, he's talking about Yahweh. He's talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's talking about the God that was sending the Messiah, who was Jesus, that that's who he's referring to. So he tells us he's referring to the one in heaven, the real God. And it's a reminder to all of us that he is out of this world. He's not part of this world. We'll talk more about that in a few. Our father is the one who resides in heaven, which means he sees things from a different perspective. 
Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He has a different perspective. Just like parents have a different perspective on things than their kids do, so they can offer them advice and wisdom and help because they have a different perspective. God's got a different perspective on your situation. And you might be praying and you've told God exactly how he needs to respond in order to fix it because you know, and then he comes along and does something totally different because he has a different perspective. And you might think that you need this thing over here, but God knows that what you really need is this thing over here. And you might think that you need rescued from this situation, and God knows better and knows that you need to get through the situation and because you need to rely on him to get through it. See, he has a different perspective. He sees things from a different angle. He sees things from an eternal perspective. So his ways are different. He's the God in heaven. So he knows better than we do because of what he can see and where he can see from. This father in heaven, he's the one on that throne of grace. He's the king of kings, he's the lord of lords, and he wants to help. I mean, that's just, it's hard to even comprehend this. He sees what we don't see, so we need to ask him for help instead of all the other advice we're trying to get in Google. He's different than us, he's separate from us, which brings us to the next phrase, hallowed be your name. Hallowed is an unusual word. In fact, most of us have probably never even used it. If we have, maybe just a little bit. And this part of the prayer, because we don't really know this word, is often heard incorrectly. Clara Null writes, My Sunday school class of youngsters had some problems repeating the Lord's Prayer. One child prayed, Our Father who is in heaven, how'd you know my name? There was a family circus cartoons years, a year, years ago that said, had the son saying, I know God's name, his name is Howard. His dad said, how do you know that? And he said, because it says Howard is your name. <laughs> the Greek word here is only translated as hallow twice in the New Testament. Once in Matthew, here where we're talking about it. The other is in Luke when it's talking about the Lord's Prayer. 26 other times it's used in the New Testament, it's translated as some tense of the word sanctify. The word means to make holy. Most of us have been taught or have come to believe that holy means perfect. But it doesn't. The word is hagios, and it doesn't mean perfection, it means set apart. Holy doesn't mean perfect, it means set apart. Now, in the case of God, he's also perfect. But the Bible refers to us as holy, and we're not perfect. Right? Okay. All right. A couple people were like, mm. The word holy means set apart. It means to be wholly other, unlike anything else to be different. The fundamental meaning of it is different because it has been purposely set apart. Our Father's name is to be made holy. The word name there means character or reputation, not the actual written name. It means their character, the reputation. So God's character and reputation should be made holy, set apart, different. The book of Ezekiel, I know, that is a book in the Bible, talks a lot about the name of God as being holy. In chapter 36, it talks about the Israelites, God's people, being disobedient. And as a result, God scatters them around to other nations. And this is what God says about them. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name or my character. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. That word profane that he uses a couple of times means to pierce. 
So instead of setting God's character apart to be honored, they pierced God's reputation and put a hole in it. Because of the way they were living. I wonder how many times we have torn a hole in the reputation of Jesus by the way we live. I wonder how many people have not come to faith in Jesus because of us, the way we've lived our lives. I wonder how many people rejected Jesus because we were their neighbors and we didn't treat them any differently than anybody else. We lived our lives just the same as everybody else does. God goes on to say in verse 23, I will sanctify my great name which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. That that word look familiar? And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. So how's God going to restore his character? How's he going to repair this hole and set his name apart? How's he going to make it holy? He tells the Israelites that he will prove himself holy through you before their eyes. So God was going to show his holiness through Israel. He's going to demonstrate his holiness through them. How? Here's how. Great question. Glad you asked. Verse 24 uh, through 27. I will take you from among the nations... Gather you out of all countries, bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. God makes his name holy by making us holy. When people see a group of people who have been set apart, who are living differently, who are holy, not perfect, but set apart, then they know that those people couldn't have done that themselves. Somebody must have done that. God makes his name holy. He repairs the tears in his character by making us holy. See, God's on another level. He's in another world. He's higher than us. But he made the choice to come low. He made the choice to stoop down to our level when he didn't have to. But he made that choice to stoop down to our level so that he could set us apart so that he can make for himself a holy nation, the Bible says. This was in the last song that we sang. Philippians 2, 8 through 11. Being found in appearance as a man, this is talking about Jesus, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, because of that, God also has highly exalted him and given him the what? Name, Name, which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His name was set apart. And he made us set apart when he did that. He makes his name holy by making us holy. Because of his death on the cross, he has made us holy. And he made a way to approach him with boldness in prayer. You see, in the Old Testament, we talked about this, that high priest got to go in to the special place. So you've got this holy person who gets to go into a holy place at a holy time of the year and gets to be in the presence of God and gets to pray and offer up sacrifices and have contact with the creator, have contact with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. 
He walked into this place, that's what happened. But this is, was where the presence of God was, was in that room. That's where the throne of God was, if you will. One person, once a year, got to go in there. But when Jesus hung suspended between heaven and earth, as he was dying, the Bible says that that curtain that led into the Holy of Holies was torn in two, which is a symbol that now anybody has access to the presence of God. It's as if the presence of God and mercy and grace was just waiting there at the edge of that curtain, waiting for Jesus to die, waiting for it to be torn. And then they all came running out of that room and made themselves available to everybody. Now anyone can access the presence of God. Do you get what I'm saying? Are you picking up what I'm laying down? Isn't that what they say? I mean, this is absolutely mind-blowing. Jesus died and made a way as he was suspended between heaven and earth. He connected the two. And now, anytime we want, we have access to the presence of God, which at one time only one person got to do once a year. You can do it once a minute if you'd like. He died so that you could talk to God. You, not somebody on your behalf, though that's good that people pray for you, but you can do it. You can go right to the throne yourself. You could say that he died to talk to you. And yet, so many times, we don't. Jesus starts this prayer with the foundation that all of prayer is built on. And if we can grasp this foundation, it will lead us into the right attitude of prayer. Here it is. In your notes, you want to write it down. We, we have a Father in heaven whose name is to be made holy through our prayer. The foundation of prayer is that God's name would be hallowed, that it would be set apart. And so our prayer, as we go into it, whatever our prayer is, we go into it with the motive that we want God's name to be set apart. We want his name to be holy. We want his name to be lifted up. We want his name to be glorified. That's the attitude that we come to the throne with is that we want him to be lifted up. Because prayer is all about him. It starts with our Father. Because that's who it's about. Let's stand together as we pray. Father God, you are are our Father. Thank you that you have made us your children. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross so that we could go to your throne anytime we want. And we don't have to be afraid. We can come boldly to your throne to find the help that we need. And Lord, I know that there's people in here right now that need help. I pray that they would call out to you. Even if it's just one word, help. We want to make your name holy through our prayers. Help us to do that. anyone here this morning has never put their faith and their trust in you and what you've done for them on the cross and the fact that you made a way for them to the Father. I pray that they would do that today. That they would commit their life to you. If you're here this morning for any reason, you need to come to these altars. They're open for you. If you've never accepted Christ, we'd love to show you how to do that. We'd love to talk you through that. We'd love to stand beside you and support you in your walk with Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't pray much. 
Because maybe you're afraid or nervous or worried. But you want to start praying boldly, knowing that he's not going to turn you away, that he's going to listen. That he's willing to help. And maybe you're here this morning and you just need grace, you need mercy, you need help. You don't even know what you need. You just need him. Maybe you just need to do that. Come down here and just cry out to him. He is our father. I pray that in all of our prayers, we will strive to make his name holy. If you need to come this morning, you can do that as we sing.